Greetings! In our second video in this new YouTube channel, we three hosts thought that we would choose one comet that we each observed in our lives and spend several minutes discussing that comet from our own perspectives. This will help further introduce ourselves and give some information about comets that may be of interest to both people avidly interested in comets and to people who know very little about comets but are eager to learn more about them. This is Dan Green, and I'll be discussing the comet C-1983 H1 Iras Araki Alcock. This comet was found on 1983 April 25th in images obtained with the then new infrared astronomy satellite known by its acronym IRAS, but it was reported as a fast moving object that was presumed to be asteroidal, not cometary. At the time, I was working as a young assistant to Dr. Brian Marsden, who directed both the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams, responsible for announcing new comet discoveries since 1882, and the Minor Planet Center, which together have archived all comet positions and orbits for a half century. IAU Circular 3796, shown here, announced the discovery to the world, which also went out as was customary then by telegram. Before the Central Bureau got positions for the IRAS object, reports of independent visual discoveries made on May 3rd by George Alcock in England and by Janichi Araki in Japan were received together with positions and brightness estimates that indicated the comet was an easy binocular object and near the limit of naked eye visibility from a dark sky. What is interesting is that Alcock discovered the comet with his 15 by 80 binoculars from indoors, looking out through a closed window. Araki's report was telegraphed from Tokyo Observatory. On the evening that we received Alcock's report, I went to the roof of Harvard Observatory and made visual measurements of the comet with my binoculars. The name Iras Araki Alcock comes from the three discoverers in chronological order of their finding the comet. It was also given a provisional designation 1983D, meaning that it was the fourth comet discovered and confirmed in the year 1983. So, Comet Iras Araki Alcock was moving rather fast, indicating that it was rather close to the Earth by comet standards, creating instant excitement due to its brightness. By May 8th, the comet was a relatively easy naked eye object for experienced observers who knew where to look in a dark sky. Preliminary orbit, orbital calculations, based on the scant early astrometry, suggested that the comet was rapidly approaching the Earth. It would pass only about 3 million miles from the Earth on May 11th, closer than any known comet since Lexell's comet in 1770. But in 1983, the discovery of comet Iras Araki Alcock, only days before a pretty close approach to the Earth, stretched our resources and the available technology to the limit. We had just converted four years earlier from computing orbits via punched cards to the use of interactive computing at a monitor with a keyboard. Announcements were still only made via printed postcard circulars and by telegram through Western Union and Western Union International. Discoveries and observations were still received mostly on paper, whether by postal mail or telegrams, with the odd comet discovery, discovery report via telephone. So astronomers and reporters were dependent on news from the Central Bureau for Comet Iras Araki Alcock, and the printed circulars took several days to be printed and mailed to their recipients. This meant that, for most people, phone calls were the only way to get information easily and quickly. The Central Bureau was absolutely swamped with hundreds of calls from reporters, planetarium personnel, professional and amateur astronomers, and even curious people unfamiliar with astronomy. This was made more difficult because Brian Marsden and I were involved heavily with observing the comet, processing incoming observations, and computing its orbit in ephemeris from the astrometry. By night, I was taking glass plate photographs at Harvard's Oak Ridge Observatory, developing them and measuring the comet's position for use in orbit calculations, as well as observing the comet visually and making brightness and size estimates. By day, I was helping Brian Marsden and our colleague Conrad Bardwell process and analyze observations from other observers around the world, as well as fielding questions and interviews by telephone. The comet grew 
brighter and larger as it approached the Earth as it moved north through the constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, and by May 11th it rivaled the brightest stars in the Big Dipper. It never showed a tail visually, so it was just a large fuzzy ball in the northern sky up all night for northern hemisphere observers. The coma size of the comet reached some three and a half degrees, or about seven times larger than the apparent size of the full moon. I give a more detailed review of this comet in a separate video here on this channel, with the link given in the summary to this video. Next, Carl gives a discussion of one of the comets that he discovered, followed by Charles discussing his observations of a bright comet more than 50 years ago. For every great comet like Hale-Bopp, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of not so great fainter comets. Hello, my name is Carl Hergenrother, and this is the story of one of those much, much fainter comets. Yes, I know, I'm talking about one of my own discoveries. But the reason why I'm discussing 168P Hergenrother is not just because it is one of my finds. Though a typical short-period Jupiter family comet, 168P has experienced a few recent traumas, which may help shed light on a topic that I hold in great interest, namely the decline and fall or death of comets. 168P was discovered on November 22, 1998, while I was working at the Catalina Sky Survey with the University of Arizona's then 0.4 meter Catalina Schmidt. At that time, we would take three images of a survey field separated by a few minutes. All CCD-based professional asteroid surveys use software to detect moving objects, but back in late 1998, Catalina was still in its infancy, so our software wasn't ready for prime time. Instead, 168P was discovered by the old method of manually blinking images. A question often asked when a reasonably bright short period comet is discovered is, well, why now? Why wasn't the comet seen before? In the case of 168P, it was located further from the Sun prior to a close approach to Jupiter in 1980. Though there were some okay returns in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, it was probably too faint for the photographic surveys at the time. The same was probably true for the two returns immediately after the 1980 Jupiter encounter. 1998 was probably the first reasonably bright return, and it definitely helped that the late 90s saw the advent of the all-sky CCD-equipped asteroid survey, like Linear, Neat, Lonios, and of course, the Catalina Sky Survey. Upon discovery, I started to look forward to future returns and whether 168P would become a brighter object. 1998, the discovery apparition was a moderately good return, but as you can see, the comet was still rather distant from Earth. The next return in 2005 was better, and the comet did reach 15th to 16th magnitude. The return in 2012 was about as good as it gets, with the comet expected to peak around 12th magnitude. Though secretly, to be honest, I was hoping it would outburst and get much brighter. And then it did. On September 6, 2012, a visual observer from Spain, J.J. Gonzalez, found 168P brighter than expected. This was the first of three outbursts that would bring the comet up to ninth magnitude. For a few weeks, it was the brightest comet in the sky, though that says more about the lack of bright comets observable at the time. These outbursts are shown here on a plot published by Zdenek Sekinina in an article he published in the International Comet Quarterly. The initial outburst, the one seen by JJ on September 6th, probably began a few days earlier on the 1st. The second started on September 22nd, and finally a smaller outburst was observed to begin on October 1st. Outbursts are the result of an increased release of dust and gas from the comet's nucleus, and are sometimes accompanied by a splitting of that nucleus. In 168P's case, six fainter secondary nuclei as well as a diffuse mass, probably consisting of fine dust, was observed in the weeks following the outbursts. Sekinina's analysis of the secondaries suggests that each of the outbursts released at least one or more secondaries. The images here, taken with one to two meter class telescopes, highlight the evolution of these short-lived features. As 2012 gave way to 2013, 168P faded as it moved away from the Sun and Earth. As seen here in one of the last images taken of the comet, it looked fairly normal and, to be honest, no fainter than expected. And then 2019 came, and as we awaited the return to 2019, well, it never showed up. 2019 came and went, and 168P Hergenrother was nowhere to be seen. So what happened? 
Did it completely break up sight unseen when it was out near aphelion, or perhaps when it was close to solar conjunction and unobservable from Earth? Back in 2007, astronomers used the Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope to observe 160AP and determined that its nucleus was between 900 meters to 1 kilometer across. So how could an object so large just disappear? Is the comet still there, but maybe inactive? One of the leading mechanisms proposed to explain the disintegration of comets is that they spin themselves apart. Comet nuclei are rubble piles and only tenuously held together by their own gravity. An increase in their spin rate, possibly due to jets outgassing from their surfaces, could spin them up past their breaking point. Perhaps the outbursts and secondaries we saw in 2012 were just the first sign of a comet in trouble. Time will tell if we ever see 168P Hergenrother again. I have been asked to talk about a comet that was important to me. I could have chosen Comet West, Comet Hale-Bopp, Comet Hayakataki, but the comet I chose was Comet Bennett, which in the new style designation is 1969Y1. But back when it was discovered, it was 1969I as a preliminary designation and given a permanent designation of 1970 number two. The reason I chose this comet is that it was my first bright comet. And it is the comet that got me interested in comet observing. This is a photograph of Comet Bennett on April 4th, 1970. It demonstrates what is so special about this comet. Comet Bennett had the brightest dust tail I have ever seen. Rather than Hale Bop, rather than Comet West, it, it was simply a remarkable object. Now, at the time, I was not a comet observer to speak of. I had seen one comet previously in 1968, and so I was not doing visual observations at the time. Comet Bennett was discovered in South Africa by John Bennett on December uh, 28, 1969. It reached perihelion on March 20, 1970 at 0.54 AU. The comet's peak brightness was about zero magnitude. Now, as I said, I was a freshman at Michigan State University. I was not paying attention to comets even though I believe I was getting the IU circulars at the time. Instead, I was home on break in late March when the Detroit Free Press, a morning newspaper in Detroit, Michigan, had an article about this very bright comet that was in the sky. So either on the 28th or 29th of March, I got up to look at it. And indeed, it was a gorgeous object in the uh, morning sky. I made the mistake of dragging my mother out of bed to look at this marvelous object. All she had to do was walk down uh, the hallway and look out the east window where the comet was on vivid display. What was her reaction? And I quote, can I go back to bed now? So everyone was not enamored with uh, this bright astronomical spectacle. When I got back to Michigan State, I photographed this comet on 17 mornings between March 30th and May 18th using high speed ectochrome film. I then wanted to do something, so I measured the comet's tail length from the pictures. On April 5th, the tail reached 23 degrees in length, and its true tail length hit nearly half an AU in length in May 1970. Was the real tail length actually longer than this? Probably. There are limitations with the 
photography, uh, unlike CCD today. Uh, based on this, I published my very first comet publication in the Journal of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers in 1971. The article was entitled, The True Tail Length of Comet Bennett, 1969i. Now this was published with hand-drawn charts. It was considerably different from what we would consider a professional publication, and it wasn't. It was an amateur publication. But it was my first comet publication. I want to leave you with one more picture of Comet Bennett, taken by Dennis Chichico, who, of course, works worked for uh, Sky and Telescope magazine. Uh, I don't know the date on this, but it indeed shows the very bright dust tail and an interesting gas tail that was not straight. So that is my special comet presentation.